the Oriented Policing Committee meeting and uh, for a Monday, July 12th, 2021. Appreciate you all being here today. Uh, it's kind of nice. We are uh, without masks and we are without barriers. And so it's great to see everybody uh, without going through the glass. So um, has anybody not signed the roster? Okay, well, pass it. <laughs> Well, gee, uh, well, we'll do the roll via signature yeah. on the roster. I'll start here with David, and once it gets done, pass it back this way, and I'll send it on down. Uh, although uh, we do uh, have a quorum for the meeting to start today. So while that uh, agenda is going around, um, what I'll do is uh, get a motion to uh, for the approval of the June 14, 21, uh, 2021 regular minutes. Do I have that? From anyone? I have a, actually have a correction on the minutes, I think. Okay. Um, for item number five, um, I believe the city manager said that the city is looking for two contractors and not the subcommittee. Is that? Okay. Excuse me, sir. Uh, we do not have quorum. We are one short. Oh. I apologize. Well, then. Um, well. You just well, don't ha can't take action. <laughs> Okay, well, let's make that uh, correction in the minutes then and have that the uh, city of Santee is uh, looking for two uh, entertaining bids from two contractors for the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion up, um, program. And then uh, if we have our forum come in, then we'll take an action on that later. So. That takes us to uh, item number three, which is updates on neighborhood watch and crime prevention events. Uh, good afternoon. The Sheriff's Department is going to be having National Night Out on August 3rd. It's one of our biggest events for law enforcement. It emphasizes the units within our department, whether it's Astria, um, Search and Rescue, Bomb Squad, which will all be at our event. It's going to be in the Santee Amphitheater Town Center. Uh, we are inviting local businesses that would like to set up. Um, I've been in contact with a few of the restaurants, but their main concern is that they may not have enough coverage uh, because of the shortage. So we're inviting community members if they'd like to be participate, it is free. Uh, we are also encouraging um, organizations if they'd like to come out uh, and put up a tent, it's free. Um, whether it's social services, um, community services available, victim services within the Santee community. We are encouraging that. Uh, we will be at the local farmer's market starting mid-August. We are going to be promoting uh, our crime-free multi-housing as well as our neighborhood watches. So whoever would like to participate or get that going for their neighborhood, we will start being there starting mid-August. Um, as of Thursday, we will be part of the summer camps with the city of Santee. And we will be doing presentations on bullying, drug use within the teenage community. So if there's any parties as well interested in that, we are here for you. Great. Thank you. Do we have any speaker slips on any of the items so far, James? Yes. Okay. Item five. Okay. Thank you. And um, any comments or questions from? Question, question Your Honor. Um, for, so if someone, if a group is interested in, in participating in any of those, would they just call the substation or what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, they can contact the Santee Sheriff's Department. We are teaming up with Lakeside, so Lakeside will be joining us. So Lakeside uh, community is welcomed as well, but they can contact me or the crime prevention specialist in Lakeside named Jake. Either station can accommodate. We just need to know maybe about a week, week and a half prior to the event so we can make sure that you have your space. Time's coming up short on that. Great. Anyone else over here? Okay. Thank you. We have quorum now, sir. Who joined us? Oh, there you are. All right, then. Uh, let's uh, move back to the approval of the June 14, 2021 regular meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? Anybody? Move. Uh, moved by David Shari. I uh, second. Second by Dr. Foreman. And uh, so are there any other additions, corrections, or deletions? Not saying. Please uh, call the roll for the vote. 
Mayor Minto? Yes. Marlene Best? Yes. Lieutenant Bodine? Yes. Angela Tomlinson? Yes. David Shorey? Yes. Mike Aiken? Yes. Linda Roach? Yes. Dr. Foreman? Yes. You pass. Passes? Approved. You, you didn't call everybody. Danette? I apologize. Danette. And uh, call the sheriffs. Did you call the sheriffs? I did. I did. Okay. I apologize. You're not chopped liver here. For, you know, not, not to all of us anyways. <laughs> all right, then let's go on down to item number four then. I'll let the record show that that did pass unanimously. Uh, item number four is San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force update. And Jeannie Franco from the San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force is here. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. I'm just going to go over um, the task force, what we do, and kind of an update on what we've seen last year and this year. So these are some of the purchase, or actually all of our participating members of the task force. Uh, the California Department of Justice Officer of the Attorney General's Office oversees the task force. So there's me. I work with them and the program manager as well. Then you'll see all of the other agencies, um, California Highway Patrol, FBI, HSI, National City PD, the San Diego uh, City Attorney's Office. We have a designated city attorney. Uh, the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. Oh, sorry, killing everyone's ears. Uh, San Diego County Probation, San Diego Police Department, San Diego Sheriff's Department. And just along those lines, this is Lee Sanchez. He's one of the sergeants on the task force with the Sheriff's Department. Um, and we also have a designated AUSA assigned to the task force. So this is our mission statement. Uh, essentially, it's basically that we're trying to identify and recover victims of trafficking and hold their offenders accountable. Um, and in, as part of that mission, we work with a lot of NGOs and victim advocates to get the victims that we encounter services. Human trafficking, this is just a, a definition. This is sex trafficking. It's basically the deprivation of liberty uh, of a person by force, fear, fraud, etc., uh, with the intent to pimp or pander. Uh, if it's a child, basically that he or she cannot consent to commercial sex, so there's additional charges that go with trafficking of a minor. Again, just some examples of force, fraud, fear, coercion. There's threats of injury or harm to someone, physical harm, withholding of documents, money, persuading through force or threats. Some of the risk factors uh, that come along with human trafficking and basically what we see with the trafficking task force, majority of our victims are juveniles. Uh, and this is a huge problem because we just saw this trend back last year when uh, COVID hit and we thought, gosh, what's going on here? Because we didn't know if this was due to COVID, if this is just a new trend, but we're seeing a lot of juvenile victims, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the risk factors there are runaways, homeless youth, drugs and alcohol, mental health, financial problems, prior trauma. I have never seen a victim that does not have some type of former prior trauma, whether it be sexual abuse, family violence, neglect, that kind of thing. Uh, lack of parental involvement and involvement with the child welfare system. So if they're in the system, there's you know a, a likelihood that we may see them on our end. So much so that the task force uh, works really close with child welfare services. We actually have three social service workers assigned to our task force, and we work hand in hand. So when they start seeing things or people are reporting things of possible um, HT, then they basically give that over to the task force and we investigate from there. Things to look for. There's all kinds of things to look for, but these are some of the main things. So unexplained luxury items. So a, a kiddo comes home with new clothes, new shoes, jewelry, hair, nails. It's like, you don't have a job. Where are these things coming from? Uh, several cell phones. Why would they have so many cell phones? You basically just have one. Bruises, tattoos, um, STDs, pregnancy, dropping of grades or truancy. Things are starting to go downhill school. Uh, changing of friends or groups, that's a big one too. It's like, wait a minute, they're starting to hang out with a different group of people, she's coming home late, or you know, we're, we're seeing a change in behavior, that type of thing. Um, older boyfriends that they're kind of secretive about. 
Hotel keys, very common, right? A lot of the sex trafficking occurs in hotels. Use of alcohol and drugs, uh, depression, isolation, again, past trauma, these things all kind of come up when these victims are being trafficked. Um, excessive use of internet chat rooms. Basically, the recruitment happens online. I mean, it can happen anywhere, but if there is an internet connection, there's vulnerability to being trafficked. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, all these social media sites, they have all these different platforms for chatting. That's, it's all open to, to basically these traffickers, right, for recruiting. Multiple social media accounts as well. So if there's a kiddo that has multiple accounts for Snapchat, it's like, why? You know, maybe they have one for the family and then others for other things. Leads. The leads are generated to the task force in all different forms. So we get them from federal, state, and local law enforcement. Mainly the local law enforcement is one of the duties of the task force is going out to local law enforcement and basically training on the risks, uh, indicators, things like that. And then once they are out in the field and they encounter something, they'll call us <laughs> and say, hey, this is what we've got. We think this might be a situation. The task force will respond. Um, we also get the leads from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So anything in San Diego that County that comes through the uh, Human Trafficking Hotline will come to the task force. So last year, 197 leads, which is pretty high considering that we were in lockdown. Um, and so this year we're right around half. Some arrest statistics, 68 arrests last year, 263 this year so far. That's mainly due to um, demand operations. So because we were seeing such a, a high volume of juvenile recoveries, juvenile victims, we said, you know what, something's going on here. We need to hit the demand. So these are the Johns, right? These are the people that are going online and buying sex. So with that, we said, you know, let's just kind of hit the demand hard, see if that brings down our numbers with all of the recoveries we're having. Well, as you can see, there's probably about 240 of those arrests are demand. So those are all Johns that seeked out sex. Um, I don't know if anybody is um, familiar with a couple of the, the uh, operations that the task force did. They were in the media. We had Century Week where there was 144 arrests. We did a week-long operation with the Sheriff's Department. We all kind of got together, Chula Vista PD, Escondido, the task force, and we ran uh, operations four days in a row. So a lot of those numbers came from that operation. And then subsequent to that, we've been doing additional demand operations. But yeah, as you can see, and we're only halfway, um, pretty high numbers. But we've got to continue to do that because that's, that's part of getting the word out, the prevention of like, hey, we're out there, we're watching, stop doing this. Jeannie, real quick, yeah. um, out of the, uh, for instance, 68 arrests in 2020, mm -hmm. are most of those uh, procurers of the uh, prostitution are there pimps involved, or what's the breakdown? Do you yes, know? so a majority of those are going to be the felony arrests for human trafficking, uh, pimping and pandering, okay. and some of the uh, demand reduction. So would that be the same so far for that 263 number? Or? Yes, but like I said, about 240 plus are the Johns, so the demand, yeah. But okay. the 68, yeah, that would incorporate the felony arrest um, of the traffickers. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, the spike in juvenile victims and uh, juvenile offenders as well. So we're starting to see a lot of the traffickers are 17, some as young as 16. So this is a problem. So we're going out to the schools as well and talking to school resource officers of things to be aware of, things to look for, because it's a problem. So. Uh, the four P's model, we use this model on the task force, prevention, Protection and prosecution partnerships, so it basically says it all, right? We go out and we educate the community, uh, local law enforcement, protection. We're there to recover the victims, hold our uh, offenders accountable. Prosecution, we have a designated uh, deputy district attorney on the board and as well as an AUSA that handles all of our cases. And partnerships, we've got great partnerships with a lot of the law enforcement agencies in the county as well as advocates. So we work really closely with victim advocates, which is awesome. Um, along those lines, uh, Task Force takes a victim-centered approach. We know how important this is when we're dealing with the victims. So basically, we don't call it a case until we've you know, asked that person if they would like to have services. And if so, 
we basically reach out to our partners who are on call with us as well um, and say, hey, we've got somebody that would uh, like some services. They'll come down, they'll do placement for the victim or whatever type of resources the victim needs. In the instance where there's a juvenile recovery, like I said, we have our child welfare uh, social workers with us. We'll call them out, they'll come out, interview the child, and they'll, they'll bring out their advocates as well. Uh, so last year, 113 adults and juveniles were assisted by the task force. Again, these are folks that um, the task force refers some type of service to. And so far, uh, we're at 46. So reporting, we basically encourage that if you see something or something is not right, to first call up your local law enforcement. Because again, it's going to get filtered down to the task force. Obviously, if it's an emergency, 911. Or there's always the option to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which again, those leads get filtered to the task force. That's basically all I have. <laughs> Try to keep it short and sweet. And if you guys have any questions or... Actually, I do, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and let the uh, panel go first. Anybody questions or comments? Uh, Danette? I have a question. When you talk about providing assistance to the victims, what does that look like? Um, the reason I ask is I'm the director of a long-term residential care program. And so you can imagine a lot of our clients who have substance use disorders are coming in because they were arrested for a drug charge but are actually being trafficked. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is once they're in the program, they're safe. Right. But then when they leave the program, they have their traffickers waiting for them to leave the program. Do you offer assistance with safe housing or transitions and care, things like that? So the advocate groups that we do work with do offer that. And we work with a host of them. Um, and so... If one can't provide housing, another one will. So those are the, that's the good thing about having so many resources at our disposal because, like I said, they all kind of work together and, you know, if there's no housing here or if they need special drug and alcohol treatment or something in particular, we can kind of refer them to different services. I can assist with the drug and alcohol counseling. The number that they would call for that assistance is the same 888 number? They can go through that number, correct. Okay, thank you. And then again, if it gets routed to us, then we would follow up on it and route it to our advocate partners. Perfect, thank you. Mark? This is interesting. Uh, takes me back quite a few years, but um, the term victim recovery kind of hit hard for me. Uh, and my thoughts start going to, what if they don't view themselves as victims? And that can add a complexity to maybe what's going on, especially when if you're dealing with somebody that's under 18. My experiences are often that these individuals are getting something from the relationship, whether it's with a pimp or with even with the, the customers that they're maybe working with, right. that they're not getting somewhere else in their life. That's exactly it. And when you mentioned prevention at the top, mm -hmm. uh, I use so many things through a prevention lens as to preventing what? If you already know about the person, it's too late to prevent that one. You can prevent future activities, future behaviors, future engagements maybe, uh, but to pre prevent that person of being able to be called into that kind of a lifestyle away from something, if we place them back into that same lifestyle, whether it's through addictions or anything else, you put an addict back into their... Uh, place of origin without somehow working with that also, they often, it, you set them up for uh, relapse. And I start thinking of, okay, well, what if we were to view uh, the victims of human trafficking as through an addiction model mm -hmm. that they, we just can't place them back in there. Uh, so I, I'm just curious, and this might not be the venue to hear all these answers because I, I recognize that I'm asking some about some complexity, but... Uh, so that, that, that's that, of uh, uh, victim recovery, and what if they don't want to go back? Or yeah, recognizing they're juveniles, you're going to place them anyway. You're going to yeah. maybe put them in residential treatment, maybe mental illness is present also or right. something like that. We encounter that a lot. It's probably a majority of the time, right, because it's like you said. They have no one in their life, so this trafficker has basically, is the master manipulator, has told them all of the things they need to hear and is giving them whatever they need. Unfortunately, it, it's a lot of bad things. So a lot of times the, the victims are not, they do not see themselves as victims and they say, yes, I don't need services and that, that type of thing. All we can really do is just kind of refer and make sure we're working with advocate groups that are on top of it. 
are making sure that they continue to call to touch base with them because they're just not ready at that moment. But that doesn't mean that down the line they're not going to be ready to self-identify as a victim. So we try to do our part and, yeah. Uh -huh. Put it down. David? Thanks. A um, few questions, actually. One, um, I know that um, a lot of instances of public venues where folks may see these, and you talked about saying, seeing something and saying something. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've been doing or wanting to do with um, my organization is involve in the responsible beverage sales and service uh, training for um, both rest, uh, restaurants and bars as well as um, the uh, liquor stores and corner markets, kind of a training about um, um, sexual, both sexual assault but human trafficking as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any kind of training that you do with these uh, more public venues where, you know, uh, even dispensaries, you know, all those kinds of things where because of the nature of the environment, it may tend to attract um, the folks who are doing the, the trafficking and maybe even the victims as well. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of formal program that you're, um, you're doing with those kind of retailers. Absolutely, because we go out and basically inform the community. So that falls under the community, right? It's anybody who is looking to kind of understand what trafficking is and risk factors and indicators and things like that. Absolutely, I'll give you my card and you can reach out to me okay. and we can definitely have a task force officer come out and do some training. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's a little daunting because of how many there are, but it might be something to create some kind of, and this is probably higher than this level, some kind of infrastructure that would entice those businesses to take that kind of training. So, Right. Well, um, it starts somewhere, right? Because yeah. just like the airports, now you'll go to the airports and you'll see signs in the restrooms about human trafficking and things like that. So it's, you know, having discussions like this and things change, so... And then a um, couple other questions. Uh, I know that the uh, Native community um, has a lot of issues around missing and exploited women. And I didn't see, and maybe because it was a lot of names on there, I didn't see um, tribal communities involved with the task force. And I'm wondering, uh, is there, or are they, because of their sovereign status, are they more independent, or what's the role of tribal nations in the work? Actually, we do. We are in communication because, like I said, we work with a lot of uh, advocacy groups, and I have worked with the tribal community. So trying to kind of put all this together to see if we can do some training. We've got sheriff deputies who are liaisons. So because we've got a sheriff deputy on the task force or and the sergeant, kind of funneling, hey, this is what we can do. If you guys suspect this, call your local liaison, and then it gets filtered. We know it's going to get filtered to the task force. So, okay. yes. Cool. And then last question, um, are you seeing any like blackmail or coercion f with undocumented f um, women, um, those who may, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to have you deported or we'll have your parents deported or things like that? Has there been uh, any kind of aspect of that or is it kind of all interwoven? So like labor trafficking basically? Um, the task force mainly deals with a lot of sex trafficking, and that's only because that's what's generating the leads and tips that we're getting. But we have uh, worked some labor cases, and so that's kind of more all-encompassing, right? So it's basically forced labor, deprivation of liberties, and things but, like that yeah. for labor services. But, um, but not, not necessarily labor services, but actually undocumented women who may be in the United States. Um, are they being targeted because of their... Um, their status, their immigration status. Yeah, we haven't really seen that as the task force. Again, the things that are coming in are kind of filtered through our, our uh, law enforcement agencies and our NGOs looking for specifically human trafficking, labor trafficking. Okay, thank you. There's probably a lot better coercion yeah. than just deportation because mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to deport somebody that's going to be potential uh, money maker for you. Okay. Is my th that what I would think. Mike, anything? Yeah, I just was curious because back in the mid-90s when I was working our gang detail, we saw a lot of the street gang members were transitioning from selling rock cocaine to working process pimping and stuff. Is that still an issue today? I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, we're definitely seeing that transition. 
Because there's more money in trafficking, right? You can traffic a person and over and over again, it, over yeah. and over. You yeah. make about a thousand dollars off one person, as opposed to selling rocks on the street. So, absolutely, we are definitely seeing um, the gangs involved in human trafficking. And then uh, I dated myself again. I remember when um, they started Craigslist became the new yeah. angle. When when Craigslist was new, then we were helping do the John details right. and all that. Is that still a Craigslist, or is it more? Snapchat and all the more modern social media uh, yeah. sites are probably even 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 I I, just, I got a weird uh, invite from on one of uh, the golf course social media site this week said so, you know like inviting me to be their friend and I looked at it and I was like this is probably yes. not legit <laughs> right <laughs> it was obviously not legit yeah. so I was, I, um, it seems like social media is just the way a lot of the yeah. there's a lot of good things from it but there's a lot of criminal uh, activity probably goes on with it as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. There's a whole host of different websites and they're popping up daily. And then again, we've got social media platforms, right? Because if you can chat, then there's that opportunity for people to be recruited or to sell services. Interesting. Thanks. Linda, anything? I just have a probably very basic question. I was wondering uh, your involvement and your support of individuals in Las Colinas. What type of outreach do you have for them? What kind of support do you offer them, particularly after they're discharged? Um, unless it has, unless they're reporting some kind of human trafficking, uh, which would basically filter down to the task force, that would kind of be our only engagement because we are, you know, specific in human trafficking. But we have actually had some um, some folks from Las Colinas reporting while they're in custody. And so we have task force officers go down to Las Colinas and do interviews. And again, so when they're out, then basically we are still referring services. There's no one that is not referred services that comes into contact with the task force. Yeah. Others. I had a question. Age group do you see mostly um, being trafficked? And if any of those are school-aged, how does that work with them still continuing school while they're in the program? Yeah, so unfortunately, like I said last year, we started to see that spike in juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, the median age, so when I was on the task force years ago, the for juveniles it was about 17, and then mainly it was adults, about 22 to 23. Now the median is about 16. Um, is actually we had a lead probably about a month and a half ago with a 12-year-old. So it's getting younger and younger. Um, unfortunately, like because of COVID, no one was really in school, and now we're seeing that spike. So we'll have to kind of see what happens as uh, this new year comes, whether or not the kids are still going to school and things like that. But a lot of times they, they are in school. There's some issues with them going and not going, but um, they are still in school for the most part of what we've seen. I think Mark made a re Mark made a really good point. Is probably a lot of the victims, or what we were calling victims, don't really see themselves as victims, and that's probably a huge obstacle for you to to get them to to uh, recognize and to actually try and get help instead of being part of the of that little click they're in. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the pimps are very, uh, you know, it's, it's a bad, bad situation. Right. For sure. Basically, um, like I said, everyone's trauma-informed and takes the victim-centered approach, which helps in the investigations, right? They understand, you know, the victims are going through a lot and kind of taking that time, building that rapport. That's kind of what sets us apart as just like throwing your locals out there. It's, you know, they they understand what's behind all of this. Because it does take some learning, right? You don't really understand until you're out there going, wait a minute, what's going on in this kid's life? Why are they at this point? But when you, you know, start getting trained on it and you're dealing with these juveniles, then you start getting a feel for like, okay, I get it. Did I hear right? You said the median age is 16 right now? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Bad stuff. That's terrible. Aren't there two demographics? There's an adult demographics and a juvenile demographic, so right? Yeah. So for the adults, like I said, it's probably between 20, 24. Um, but right now, there, there really is a spike in juveniles. Right. The majority of our victims now are, are juveniles. Okay, great. 
And given that, and the last couple of comments have triggered this question for me, um, what kind of support or recommendations can you give to the parents or the families of those minors? Um, are there resources available for them? So that is one thing that um, I've been working with one of our advocate partners on, North County Lifeline, because as task force officers, they're getting questions from the um, family saying, what can we do? I don't know how to deal with my child. They're out of control. I need help. And so I spoke with the advocacy group and said, hey, what, what is there for these parents? So just as of probably about a month ago, they actually brought someone on board to deal with parents' issues, counseling groups, that kind of thing. And I think that's going to get bigger because it really is um, something that the parents need and that comes across to us as a task force. Yeah. Another question. Um, you talked about ages. I don't, and I apologize, it was on there. I didn't see demographics um, like uh, ethnicities. Um, did you, is there a, 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 even across the board, is there certain groups that seem to be more targeted? It really is um, everyone, and I always get this question, but I like to just say it can happen to anybody. It's like not a certain group. It really can be anybody because if you figure if there's a juvenile out there that's going through some issues and maybe some, you know, um, I don't know, just issues and they, they've got past trauma, things like that, they really are vulnerable to these people that are telling them that they can give them the world and make them happy. Um, and that can happen to anybody, frankly. So. It's, it's interesting because we mentioned about airports. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been very, uh, Deputy uh, uh, Detective, you might help me out with this one, but uh, it's very, it was, used to be very common that bus stations, train stations, airports, parks, any place that kids would end up by themselves, they've got a backpack on or a suitcase, and they're just lingering. Uh, they're great uh, targets because uh, the people that are profiling, if I can use that word, will f look for these uh, young people and befriend them and then go through the process of, uh, I think you call it grooming now. Back in the day, we called it brainwashing. And uh, bring them into is is that still very common? Uh, and, yes, and please give us your name for the record. Uh, uh, Sahid Sacha. So I'm a, I'm a sheriff's uh, sergeant assigned to the Human Trafficking okay. Task Force. And you're correct. So all those places where these predators can target someone and bring them into that life are, are still there. Malls, uh, mass transit areas. But really, I mean, with the proliferation of uh, social media, that is really their their primary hunting ground now. Mm -hmm. They. They're ahead of the curve, you know, the younger generation, government, law enforcement is always trying to catch up on the latest trend. Um, really, you can communicate to anyone via the different social media platforms. That's why uh, you know, collectively, as, as a group, it's, it's, it's wonderful we're having this presentation, having this discussion, because you know, the questions come, you know, what, what kind of support are they getting in, in um, sheriff's facilities or anywhere in the process? And... Um, the Human Trafficking Task Force role, they're criminal investigators. They have a challenge where they have to get a case, deal with the victim, um, evidence, collect that evidence, present a case to the, either the United States Attorney's Office or the District Attorney's Office. And, um, but then we have this victim that needs to be made whole. And what do we do with that person? It's, it's, that partnership we have with our non-governmental organizations is really important to give them the added support they need. And uh, I think that's key to getting the discussion out. Human trafficking happens everywhere. It's not just at a transit depot or at a mall. It's anywhere there's an internet connection, and that's everywhere. That's everyone's problem. Yeah, you know, um, part of part of the reason for having this at a community placing meeting is that this is broadcast live, and we want people in our community to know that there are people working on this. We're looking at it. You're, the, the sheriffs are working hard, San Diego police, Chula Vista police, all law enforcement agencies. And uh, there are the resources out there like the task force. And, you know, Mark and I used to work back in the day on pimping, pandering, and prostitution. And I, I, I can't speak for Mark, but my opinion was is that we always had a hard road to hoe because there wasn't the concern then 
that there is now. It was more about, well, go out there and make a bunch of arrests, and if you can help the kids or the adults, okay. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of follow-up resources for them, uh, except, okay, well, we, we go to court, you got a conviction, now you're on your own. I don't know, Mark, if do you, did you kind of see a little bit of that or a lot of that back then and how the it's changed so much over the years to the concern for the people who are victimized? Yeah, definitely. Um, in the 80s, long time ago, uh, it was all out on the street. And only escorts and hotel services were starting to come into the arena back then. Uh, this is all pre-internet. Now, what I'm hearing you guys are describing is most of this is happening vir through the virtual uh, resources that we have available to us. But one of the things that I'm hearing that is very consistent, going back to the question David was posing and Linda opened up with, is that socioeconomically, there are no boundaries to it. You know, we think, well, most prostitutes come from poor families. Well, not always. If there's something dysfunctional within the family anywhere, which there is in all socioeconomic environments, the one case that was, wrenched my heart the most when I was investigating this kind of stuff was a 12-year-old that came out of a Air Force major's family up in Riverside County. And first glance, it looks like she had everything going for her, but there's something not working well for her. And she is very mature for her age, uh, street streetwise. And I'm only imagining what that's like now for you guys as you place that into the internet realm with the proliferation of uh, the changing, the morphing of what pornography consists of nowadays. Without telling too many old stories, what is okay now in pornography was obscene way back in the 80s. So we were looking at different laws and, and whatnot. And the normalcy of what youngsters are engaging with earlier in their life span uh, and what it does for them, linking it to uh, we, last, last time we talked about the adverse childhood experiences and whatnot, the, the connection to when things aren't going well within the family and how it links through, even within the Johns. If we were to do psychological evaluations on the, the customer base, we'd start to find that they also are carrying life experiences that aren't working well for them. There, there's supply and demand. At, at the basic economic level, supply and demand, and it's, the demand's been there a long time, and it doesn't seem to be going away. And your numbers are showing that it's getting worse. It's increasing. And, Mayor, just to touch a little bit on that, I think a lot of that change comes from education, right? Whereas before it was just prostitution. Now it's like, wait a minute, take a harder look. Is there somebody forcing them to do this? What's going on behind the scenes? Right. Um, and that's kind of a, a major task that we as a task force do, right? Educating law enforcement, kind of changing the way of thinking, like maybe it's just not prostitution. Look a little further. Are there any of these indicators? That type of thing. Yeah, that's kind of the way we looked at it back then, though. Um, some of us uh, that were in that business, we, we knew that prostitution just went along with pimping. But uh, in order to stop some of the people from victimized, we felt, you know, very um, gratified that we got a pimp in prison because there was somebody else that they weren't going to attack or they weren't going to victimize. Unfortunately, it was like a shark's tooth. There's always somebody else there to take their place. And my guess is that uh, based on the numbers, there's a lot of sharks out there still. And uh, they're still victimizing. So this job is never going to be done. So I just want our community to know and anybody who watches that, uh, that we're working on this, that we're concerned, and that uh, you know, we're going to keep funding it as much as we can and uh, make sure that we take care of especially these kids that are being victimized. And if we had one way of solving that, we'd snap our fingers and it'd be gone. But it's not. It's been around since the turn of time. And so we just keep working on it. So thank you very much for your presentation and being here to ask, answer the questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> All right, that takes us to item number five, which is a report on diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, for an update. Um, Marlene, do you want to start off with that? 
Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, very quickly, we've reported to the COMPOC uh, several steps that we've been taking in recent months as follow-ups to the subcommittee's recommendations. I wanted to let you know that we have uh, gone under contract with uh, two different contract vendors, and the city has been working with the vendor who's going to handle the survey. Uh, as we referenced at our last meeting, there will be a two-pronged approach. One would be focused to make sure that we're getting responses from um, specific individuals that we feel fit that model that we haven't heard from who maybe don't you know, regularly check the city website to see if there's a survey up. You know, they're going to be sitting at home. We want to make sure to get through to everybody. Uh, so there's a focus group that uh, the vendor is going to be working with. And then uh, very soon we are going to have the survey up on the city website. We learned from our town hall meeting that we will make sure that we get information out to the community about the survey so everybody has a chance to answer that. And the one holdup that we have right now is we're waiting for uh, the survey that's being done and being finished up by the collaborative. The Santee Collaborative has a survey out right now, and a lot of people are already confusing that with the city of Santee. They're responding as if it was coming from the city when the collaborative is one that's really sponsoring that particular survey. So we're working with them to make sure that their survey comes down before we start a survey on the topic from the city of Santee. When those answers come back in, the vendor will, I say slice and dice, but they will analyze those. And then we'll put together a town hall coming up. The goal would be early this fall to be able to have the community see all of those responses, have a chance to answer them, say, well, that's not how I feel, or yes, I agree, or did we talk about this? What do we want to do with that? So that we have more free and open discussion on the topic and be able to get some real responses we can bring back. The subcommittee was very... Um, I think diligent in wanting to make sure that we were looking at community values and establishing some goals that are based on the community values that we see coming out of the survey responses and the town hall. Uh, as we referenced last time, we're do looking at two different vendors so that we have a broad breadth of information and, and perspective on the answers. So it's not all just coming from one source. Uh, different people will have an opportunity to look at um, giving us some information on that. The other thing that I think is important for this group to know is that uh, the environmental justice survey that was done for the upcoming update of the city's uh, housing element um, has been moving forward. We're bringing that forward Wednesday night, actually, for a little bit more money to wrap up that process and bring that forward. The vendor there was very supportive and appreciative of the answers that we got from sharing uh, with the compact committee about some of the responses there. So that was a positive for us. And um, additionally, um, with Erica's assistance, who's Erica Hardy is our Director of Human Resources and Risk Management, um, she's been able to get us some good training for city staff so that at this point all of our city employees have had a chance to participate in an unconscious bias training. So that's a step in the right direction. As well, we have an opportunity uh, to move forward on a variety of other topics that Eric has been kind of leading the charge on. And if you look at the city's website, you'll see a lot of additional cultural information that's on the website. Uh, we aren't able to always place it in the places that we want due to the template format of the website. But we do have, and I'm happy to say that the city council members at their last meeting in June approved a budget, so we have some money to redo the website. So we'll be working on that process coming up this year so that the website is more responsive and interactive with the community's needs rather than fitting the standard, I'm a government website, this is what I do, click here, click here, click here. If you don't get what you want, sorry, call City Hall. That's not the kind of website that the city of Santee wants, so we're working on trying to make some changes for that. Uh, but uh, we're really happy to be able to let you know that we're going to be coming out with some of the survey materials as soon as we have a date, we'll let Compoc know about that, all the members of Compoc, so you know when it's going up. You can helpfully give us if, you know, if your group hasn't been informed that it's open, we want to make sure to get that information out. Please let us know that. Uh, we've gone through a variety of different individuals to make sure that we change some of the wording and make sure that this particular survey is more geared towards Santee and gives us some of the information that we really need to be able to move our process forward. And then we'll talk all about that when we get 
some responses back. So that's an update. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Uh, Mark? Yep, thank you for that. Um, unconscious bias training, how might that compare to implicit bias training? Uh, are they the same? Are, they, are, are, are the people that are given the training teasing out that there's a, a difference there? Um, they are teasing out a difference, but I'm not the expert on that process. Uh, I don't know, Erica, if you have anything you want to respond on that one or not, but um, we've, we've really been focused on the term unconscious bias because of its prominence, of course, but uh, I can tell you that I learned a lot in going through the process, and it does look at broader than just, let's say, the political issues that are you know top of mind with all of the latest headlines. It gets really down deep to look at what people, how people form their own values and what they base that on and, and the impressions and, and the prejudices, if you will, about how those are formed. I don't know if that answers your question, Mark. But. It doesn't, but uh, <laughs> maybe offline or something. Uh. Come on. Come on up here. Erica? Erica. Come on down. You're the next contestant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Internally, there we go. Sorry. The trainings that we've had internally had several subjects around it. So the name of the training is unconscious bias. But there is some education about implicit bias. And then it talks even about emotional intelligence and then how that kind of falls into our general unconscious bias uh, definition. I think that we as a society have kind of taken on recently as our own. So several different things, especially like how unconscious it really is and that some biases are important, shortcuts. I'm speaking to the doctor that probably knows all about those shortcuts <laughs> that we use, and that's, that's what biases do in a positive way for some, some things. So, yeah, it was, it was kind of a broad training. That's what I was hoping you would say. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. May I ask a follow-up question to that? Raising a level of awareness is one thing. Is, did it also include uh, proactive measures that could be taken once that level of awareness has been raised of your implicit bias or unconscious bias? What kind of uh, recommended course of action? So we talked about that. I think early in the plan for the city, one of the things we were looking for was those uncomfortable conversations and trying to create an environment where maybe those would happen in a, appropriate way and um, we gave some tools on what to say when you're faced with maybe some biases that make you uncomfortable or you witness as a bystander these are all the key terms coming up in the media these days um, as a bystander what to do um, but I think it's an ongoing education I don't think us doing it one time is going to be it and so we're trying to kind of foster that you know it's an environment ongoing, not just a one-day training. So. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that because it does require follow-up and it does require some role modeling. It does require some practice because very often you're exposed to it in a very awkward situation. And the more you've had an opportunity to practice it in a safe environment, the more natural the response will be. And I think even in the safe environment, it's tough, right? Yeah, so <laughs> I think, um, you know, some of the tools that the instructor gave us and kind of the approach we've used is we're starting out on the journey. <laughs> we're not mm -hmm. going to be perfect mm -hmm. right off the bat. And so the more we practice it, and even within city staff, confidentially, we've had some conversations about things where I was surprised and kind of happy that people felt comfortable having some of those conversations, approaching it just about different things. And so that's new for us. So we're on the journey. <laughs> we're Thank on the you. journey. And one of those things is that you have to find a level of comfort in the conversation. Because I don't care how safe you make this room and, you know, well, we're going to have the deputy there, and if somebody says something out of line, we're going to come after him, whatever. But a lot of people still won't say something. It's just like you mentioned the see something, say something. Well, a lot of people don't say anything, even if they see it, because they're either fearful or they are not comfortable or, oh, somebody's going to look at me, they look down on me for saying something. 
So those are a lot of the practices that you have to get away from. It's where we're comfortable saying, you know what, I, I know you have a scar on the side of your face, but I'm not comfortable seeing it. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to find something that's crazy there to use an example. So, but David? Um, thank you. Um, and, and along that line, that we're not trying to shame people, per se. It, it, this is not about shame. As, as she said, it's, it's a, a progress um, point, and, um, and I know that we've got some speakers as well, Your, Your Honor, but um, you said you had selected a, a contract. Can I ask who it is? Is that public knowledge yet, or...? Uh, it it's not okay. public knowledge yet, okay. but we will be able to announce that when we send all of you the information about the actual survey being ready to go. Okay. Um, as you know, we were able to get it in a budgetary number that the city could move forward with. We looked at um, a long list of different providers, and unfortunately, almost all of them were much higher than what our budget was, but... We did find a couple of really good ones that were recommended by other communities uh, here in San Diego County, even in, in Orange County and Riverside County. So they're familiar with Southern California. They're familiar with the issues in California. They're familiar with the history of Santee. Mm -hmm. We made very clear we're not trying to hide anything. You can't deal with it if you don't. You can't fix it if you don't know it's broke. Right. So you have to be realistic. And... Um, it is a it's it's a different vendor than actually I don't know if Compact or rather uh, the collaborative even used a vendor I think they made it up themselves so while I think that was a very good effort we wanted something that was professionally done by people that know how to create questions that give you data not just an opinion but yeah. that you can really make into data to really make some action steps from that and we had an opportunity to meet with the collaborative folks to discuss their survey. And they did a, they really did a good job mm -hmm. um, as individuals and in pulling together some ideas. And I think they were kind of afraid to to review the responses <laughs> with staff, thinking, "Oh no, you're, they're not going to like the fact that you have a nickname." And yeah. and we said, "No, we know that. Yeah. That's why we're trying to move things forward. It's okay." And and we really appreciate all of those efforts because that's what's giving us the chance to move things forward. Yeah. And um, I think the survey that, that, that the collaborative did was a really good stepping stone for us. We forwarded that to our vendor so they would see what's already out there in the community. And we gave them a copy of our branding survey that we did uh, about a year or so, year and a half ago, when we did the new brand for the city because some of these topics kind of bubbled up a little bit in that process. So we gave them all of that material and said, look, we have a history. I'm not yeah. trying to hide it. Let's, but we need some real focused information to give us some data, and then we'll combine that with what we've learned out of those other studies and what the collaborative was able to pull together um, and support. And, and the collaborative has been really, really supportive of this effort. So. Yeah, the, um, a couple of things. One, um, I think one of the lessons the collaborative learned was also having multiple languages with the survey, um, which I don't believe the collaborative we. I I'm, I'm, feel like I'm wearing two hats because I attend the collaborative <laughs> meetings here. But um, so that opportunity. And then um, I wonder um, if there might be a possibility, uh, if they've considered this, that rather than have the people come to the survey, take the survey to the people in certain instances. So if there are particular uh, venues that, you know, it might be good to to go to those places and say, could you, could we spend some time and ask you these questions, do the survey with them so that it's, um, you know, whether it's because of, of, you know, language barriers or technological barriers or, or what, or just not feeling comfortable doing that if there's that possibility. Um, right now I will tell you that the survey is designed to be an online survey. Okay. It's not to have people go out and meet with individuals. Um, a lot of people don't want to have that conversation personally in front of a total stranger. Right. They're generally more comfortable speaking, you know, answering something online. But the vendor that we have selected really is going to push looking at a focus group to get at least to make sure that we look at a focus group that gives us 
a real balanced demographic of Santee in many ways, and we get responses from a balanced demographic, so we can chalk that up and review it, slice and dice against the online survey, mm -hmm. where, you know, if every, I don't know, pick a group, if every Girl Scout had an opportunity to answer the survey about Thin Mints, you're going to find everybody <laughs> likes these Thin Mints. But maybe somebody else is more like peanut butter, and, you know, they just didn't get the word. So everybody says, oh, all the Girl Scouts love is Thin Mints. Well, no, it's just because everybody else didn't get the word to answer the survey. So we are really trying to make sure that we get out to, to all the groups. And if, again, if you or, or anybody on Compact has a group that you think should be targeted, hi, Steve, um, should be targeted to make sure that they have a chance to see the survey, that they know it's up, let us know if there's a language that we're missing. Let us know if there's, you know, any other any other issues in getting the word out. Because, like I said, we learned from the town hall meeting that we need some help mm -hmm. reaching all the groups. And so, anything that you've got out there, we'll we want to push it, yeah. and, and we'll try to get it out there. And just one last thing, the, just to give a compliment to the city planning staff, the meeting that was held about the environmental justice um, component and. Um, the request to open the survey that they were doing back up, and they did. And um, I really uh, want to just put on the record that I really um, am thankful for the work that they did, and the openness and the flexibility on that. So, thank you. Pass some, that along. Yeah. I I just had a a couple of comments. Number one was a recommendation or a suggestion, possibly with regard to the survey. I don't know if um, if it would be appropriate to mention that the survey is available at the farmer's market. There are a lot of individuals from Santee that attend the, San, uh, the farmer's yes. market, and that might be a good uh, marketing venue, if you will, for the survey. The second question that I have was, I, would it be appropriate for the members of the ad hoc committee to be able to take a look at the draft of the survey before it's pushed out? We're looking at that right now. Um, it's, it's pretty much ready to go. And Eric and I are working with another small group of staff on what the timing is of all of that to see if we could get it to you guys, give you a chance to just review it real quickly. That would be great. Um, I think that we've done a pretty decent job answering all of the questions and comments that we've heard from you guys in the past. That doesn't mean that we know what you're thinking internally. So uh, we're looking at that to see if there's an opportunity for that. That would be great. Thank you. Great. All right. I'm going to try and get a public comment in. <laughs> Uh, because we are running short on time here, but this is all pretty important stuff to talk about. So who, uh, let me guess who the speaker is on this. <laughs> yes, Steve Stallman. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, thank you very much for a great report, Marlene, and, and for all the uh, really intelligent questions that were asked about that. I've been crossing off questions on my list as you guys have been going through. Um, one thing... Uh, I think there are two main things left that I have on here, and one is out of curiosity, Marlene, I don't know if you can share this, but um, how how far off target were we budget-wise in terms of, you know, we, rec we in the, uh, as the ad hoc committee recommended some big names in terms of getting uh, help to do this stuff, and you did a uh, great job going even back to the city council trying to get additional funding for this, really how, just just for everyone who ever attempts to do this in the in the future perhaps, how far off were we uh, in budget in being able to have a broader selection of uh, partners? And my other question uh, is maybe for the mayor or, or, uh, tech, or it's, it's sort of a technical group, but it's awesome to be here and, and get to see people's faces instead of just doing the Zoom thing. Um, one thing I noticed, though, and this even came up in the, in the quarantine Zoom era, that a lot of people mentioned even on Zoom calls, it was hard to participate uh, at a, a 2 p.m. time during business hours, all those kind of things. I think a great job has been done with Santee TV in broadcasting this to a bigger group of people. But are there legal and technical opportunities to improve the input side of this for people who can't show up at City Hall at 2 o'clock on a weekday to be able to make public comments? So those are my two questions. Well, let, let me answer that technical question first. Um, what, one of our desires 
was that because this meeting is going to repeat several times between now and that, let's say the next 30 days, uh, what people are um, having an opportunity to do now is send us those questions, send us their comments, uh, because we get that, all the council gets their comments, and uh, that way we can be prepared to answer those comments. Because quite frankly, a lot of times when someone calls in or somebody comes in, we don't really have an answer for them right away. And uh, we would really like to make sure people get the right answer, or the best answer, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just kind of faking it. And um, so uh, other than that, I mean, uh, uh, unless you have some other idea on that, I think, I think that's the way I know that's where I like to see it done. So is it, are you saying that there is an opportunity prior after the agenda is put out, but prior to the meeting that people can mail in questions? Well, there is before and after. Okay. So, Always. Yeah. Okay. So if people Always. see this and generate a question, they go, oh, I got da 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 And then we get informed about that. So it's just like the, uh, the human trafficking. Somebody who sees that, a parent maybe, will say, Oh my gosh, you know, my daughter's coming home and she's wearing rings and stuff that I don't know where she's getting this from and she's certainly not uh, having my permission to get tattoos. They're going to be calling in now. So that's our, our hope for broadcasting this. So, and Steve, on the other question regarding the budget, um, most of the vendors that I think we looked at, Erica correct, can correct me if I'm wrong, but most of them either had a budget just for the survey part alone, well over 80, and most of them were over $100,000 for the survey. And many of them that we weren't looking at are so busy because this is such a prominent topic right now, a couple of them never even got back to us with a price. And the, some of them that did, some we really were interested in, um, okay, well, we'll put you down for like February or March or you know, maybe next spring sometime we can get to you. We're just, I mean, we're not a large, large city that's going to make somebody big headlines that they've got a new contract with X. Um, not to say that they, their other vendors weren't concerned, but, you know, with a budget, the combined budget for the town hall and the survey right now, we're at $50,000. I'm not afraid to go to council and say the next steps are going to be a little bit more. But if we can get some decent people within those dollars, we want to try to move that forward for 50 and if it doesn't get us what we want, then we'll go back and we'll ask for something else. The next steps may take more than that because, you know, we want more input. But to go over $100,000 just to do the survey uh, was a little gulp. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, Thank you, Bob. Not to mention, uh, when we started this, uh, we were at the end of a budget cycle. So... Um, it's easy to get some money outside uh, at the back end of a budget cycle, but then it's even more fun to go get more money at the beginning of a budget cycle. Who's so. making the ask there? <laughs> you do it all the time, trust me. I know. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. D did we get your questions answered? Okay, great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, great. Thank you. That takes us to item number seven. Uh, I'm sorry, number six, which is communication from committee members and staff. Anything? Committee members? Staff? I'm sure you have some. Yes, sir, I do. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody about the upcoming city council, city council, city special events, the city concert series. Um, those are moving forward, and we're just super excited uh, that we have the next one's going to be uh, this coming Thursday, the 15th, and it's, it's you know, check out online. It's going to be really, really great. I will tell you, in linkage with that, some of the things the city wanted to do during our 40th birthday celebration were some multicultural festival-type events, and unfortunately, when the public health order said, eh, no, ex nay on the getting everybody together thing, so those had to be pushed to the side. So as we are coming out of COVID, things are opening up a little bit more. Uh, our staff has done a really great job of scheduling out the concerts, but we're also trying to look at what other opportunities we might have to bring in somebody else, uh, you know, under a separate dollar figure somewhere to, to do some other cultural events in the city to broaden the scope of uh, 
you know, education, if you will, and, and fun that the city can experience. So we're also looking at that. Great. Thank you. Danette, do you have anything for us? Thank you. Okay. All right, then. That takes us to uh, communication from public. Number seven. We have one speaker, Robert Gassman. The only one today. Good afternoon, everybody. Mr. Mayor, good to see you again after see such you. a long time. Mr. Aiken, Mr. Foreman, good to see some faces I recognize. Um, I've been a citizen of the city of Santee since 1991, and my true core belief is that this city has always enacted policies and procedures that, uh, with the idea that it was the right thing to do and that the city always promoted its citizenry to be good citizens. Um, as the city manager mentioned earlier, I've been uh, over the years kind of, have mentioned it time to time that uh, we do not communicate very well as far as getting information out to the public via social media, so kudos for the city manager to try to improve that. And I actually became aware of this committee's meeting because of a Facebook post, so I don't carry a lot of social media accounts, but I do see that, so no. Um, this committee is on my radar as far as that goes. And as being a uh, law enforcement professional with uh, 30 plus years of experience, these topics that are discussed and brought up and mentioned in the meeting uh, notes are near and dear to me. So my quick question is, as I start my uh, fact-finding journey about the committee is um, where I can go to read about the goals and objectives of the committee the existence of a strategic plan, reference uh, the activities of the committee. And lastly, is there is a, a table of metrics of success or effectiveness of the committee that I can uh, see that. It would be my idea that uh, these ideas are something that are core central to a committee such as this. Um, as Mr. Aiken and Mr. Foreman are well aware of back in the day, we like to throw that term around problem-oriented policing, committee-oriented policing are terms that I'm very familiar with. So my email is on the, uh, my speaker slip, if that's the effective uh, venue to get that information. And I can clarify that because it is a little uh, specific, so I don't want to make sure that I have the right email for you folks to address those issues. So I thank you for your time. Good to see everybody again, and uh, let's move forward. Thank you. You know, I, I'll just respond to a couple of things that you said. You know, this is a uh, committee that really has transitioned a lot over the years. Uh, back in the day, we didn't have nearly as many com committee members, for instance. And uh, it was schools, and of course, they're not here because they're out for summer. And um, matter of fact, we had trouble with um, just having attendance at our meetings. So we changed them to a, you know, once a month meeting every day, every month at the same time and day. That kind of goes a little bit to what you're talking about too, Steve, where we've tried some different ideas on dates, times, and things, and we need to get our partners here. That's why we're doing it at certain days and times. But um, there was a time where, you know, with just about eight people sat around the table and really didn't talk about a whole lot of anything. And uh, we would get a regular update from the sheriff on, you know, well, how many burglaries took place, you know, in the cars at the uh, Target lot or whatever it might have been. But over the years, we've been adding, for instance, community-based groups, groups that uh, have a greater impact and input on what's going on in the community because they're actually hearing it at a more regular uh, rate. And so uh, now, uh, you know, especially when we weren't televised, we didn't have a lot of people coming in, we had a variety of topics, but it was just us hearing about it. The hope now is that because people are looking into that camera or seeing it with that camera into our meetings, we're going to be bringing back some of the uh, topics that we've had before, everything from drug trafficking that occurred in our city at one time, just as not that it's happening now, but uh, that it happened and how we took care of it down to, uh, you know, other things. Uh, we have the... Um, I don't know, law enforcement coordination center out before talking about a lot of different things like that trafficking so there's a lot of things we can come up with as a matter of fact that takes me to my next topic for that before we leave today is that some of the um, topics that we have planned for presentations are 
bullying, which will be actually our next um, uh, meeting, and then uh, alcohol regulations, uh, an update on fentanyl and what's going on with that, uh, the marijuana issues in Santee, uh, then um, our sheriff's going to talk about our homeless outreach program and whatnot. And then uh, as, as time goes on, we're going to learn more about, you know, community um, uh, septed, you know, crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, so a variety of things. And the idea is that when people watch us, they become informed about what we are talking about in our city. What is it that's going on with our law enforcement agency and our community groups that have partnered together? So um, I think we're kind of stepping off in a whole new direction so that people can be better informed. And as we continue to talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion, that is going to make a whole lot of difference. I just, it's like we've talked about all day long. Education. The more we learn, the better we become. Uh, we sit around the table here, and even though we have a dais up here and, and there's folks out in the audience, uh, it's, I try and make this very uh, as informal as possible because I want people to feel comfortable here and talking about and asking questions. Uh, unfortunately, because of the setup we have, uh, you know, we, we have to have people come up to the microphone. When we were in the back room, it was really great. We'd all sit around. We didn't have to worry about speaker slips or or any of that, just pipe in. And maybe we'll get back to some kind of little bit of that because that it makes a better community group meeting, in my opinion. So we might get back to that eventually, but we've got to figure all this new stuff out. But I hope that answers your question, Bob. Okay. David? I know I'm not supposed to respond directly to folks. <laughs> and that's a brown act or something like that. You can't respond during comments. So I'll address my comments to you. Um, so I, I think that the point that he raises is actually a, a good one in terms of um, we have our planned presentations that we do. But I, I know I've heard a couple of times out there, well, what is Compact, Compact for and what do you do? And like, what's their mission? Are they to be oversight for the sheriff's department? Are they to, you know, address crime? Are they to be informational? So maybe it might be good for us to, to kind of adopt not necessarily a, a full-on strategic plan, although I'm a strategic plan geek who loves to do that kind of stuff. Um, but it might be good when we're doing maybe our, our plan presentation discussion to kind of think ahead about, what is what is our mission? What is our our our, our point for the community, um, so that it's you know we're not accused of not doing our jobs um, up here, and and whether it's um, because I think there is a, a view that well why why aren't they you know investigating the the sheriff's department and their their activities or why aren't they doing this? So it might be for both the benefit of the committee as a whole and the benefit of the community to kind of define. Our role, and I know that when you adopted the ordinance for the uh, creation of the committee, you probably had something in there. But it might be good to maybe revisit, not revisit it, but at least make that more aware, more public. Yeah. So, so, but that's that's true because, unfortunately, it's like many organizations. You just kind of go along doing the thing you do forever, and then you kind of forget. Well, how do we get this whole thing started, anyways? What? So. Revisiting that is actually the right thing to do. It's, it's, it's probably good timing. Hey, Mark? I, yeah, piggybacking I, off of uh, what David just shared, but uh, on the future list of planned presentations, I guess I'm making a request is that each of the presenters maybe be primed before they come in to address ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences, and Trauma Systems of Care trauma-informed systems of care. Uh, it's been brought up in this committee for several meetings now, uh, not just from me but from other members also, the, the concepts of how we're trauma-informed. But if we're not asking as a committee to be, well, can you pin how trauma-informed might affect fent fentanyl uh, sales and use or marijuana or alcohol? It, the thread runs through all the topics, uh, bullying will be a big one coming right out of the, right out of the gate. Uh, so I'm only I'm, I'm wondering if that's an appropriate request to just prime the presenter. Say, hey, you'll probably get questions on this if, you, if the term's foreign to you. 
stand by uh, or not. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm a, a lone voice here, but... Uh, I don't think so because, you know, when we used to make presentations, we didn't think about things like this, uh, how it drills down into, you know, social, you know, issues. And uh, there, I'm, there might be a good chance that, you know, hey, you know, law enforcement's law enforcement, and they're really there to hook and book more than anything else. And sometimes they, you know, hearing questions like that brings something new to the um you know, forefront that they address. And why not have one of those professionals on staff be able to address something just like that? So I, I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Ma'am? Um, Mr. Mayor, just real quickly, for some of the presenters that we might have going forward, those are foreign terms. I mean, if we're talking about school districts, talking about what are they doing with what's going on in their in their schools, those kinds of things. So. While we want to educate them, I don't. I don't want to scare away presenters because they they don't know how to make their presentation in that box. But it may be something we can certainly work on because I think over the year we will have much broader presentations than just the sheriff's department and the DA's office, et cetera. We're going to get a bigger perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just. I think it's very good, and we can certainly school people and how those things thread together. But I don't want to scare away future presenters. So, okay. well, Mark's got a follow-up on that. I'm just wondering if we don't start asking mm -hmm. and scare them away. It's like I'm not about scaring them away either because I'm all about leaning into the fear and bringing it forward and then moving into it. More of they got Google. Trauma systems, trauma-informed systems of care, they will get a flurry of responses back. And it, each of these organizations, are, are, they're full of smart individuals. They know how to, if they've never heard it before, they go, they're asking something. Yeah. What's that got to do with us? What's that got to do with this uh, Drug Enforcement Administration? Oh, yeah, that's why we exist. They have the ability of going there. And to not ask them the question uh, might be maybe a little bit too much hand-holding uh, to maintain the systemic systems that we already have in place of, hey, we're going to ask you some new questions. Some people might be doing that and not even know it. And they probably are, because everybody that I've seen come through here, they care a lot about the people that they're serving. Yeah. They don't always name it that way, but they do. That's why they're so good at it. They're little, sli little slices of whatever their pie is, and once we start to have a common frame, oh, we're all coming at this through the same lens. At least this lens of trauma systems informed care yeah, that's why I'm a law enforcer. That's why I'm a social worker. That's why I'm a this or whatever. Or yeah, yeah. that's why okay. I'm a politician. Even it's like it's, it's all there. It's, yeah. yeah, throw that one out there, huh? Yeah. Okay, Lindy, yeah. do you have some? Yes, I do. I'd like to return to uh, David's observation. I do remember about this time last year we started the conversation about defining clearly what it was that Compoc was to do and um, what, what structure it was to take, uh, what agendas it was to follow. Um, and that didn't really, what we did is we took a look at what was out there, but we didn't take any definitive action on um, updating it, if you will. So if it would be appropriate, perhaps we could add that to our list of agenda topics to really revise and update um, the mission of the Compact Committee. I, I think that would be a good idea. It's actually a um, good um, recommendation because we really have kind of gone overboard on that discussion without it being agendized. So it's oh, yes. close to the Brown Act uh, issue that you mentioned. So okay. so let's go ahead and do that. We'll, we'll put that on the agenda somewhere. And let's do it sooner than later because it doesn't have to be like a presentation type of thing just can be a general item and we can talk a little Thank bit you. about it. So does that work? Okay. Answer your question? Anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, item number eight, that takes us to the next compact meeting date and agenda item, which will be August 9th, 2021, and bullying will be the topic. Uh, so let the uh, record show that we stand adjourned.